So we are going to um, go system by system here. Our first one that we're going to start with today, just talking about sort of an overview of the body systems. And we'll start with the skeletal system and then make our way into the muscular system uh, after that. So you learn about these in health class. Now, here's a list of the systems that we'll be talking about. The first one, however, we're not really going to spend much time on. In fact, I'm just going to mention it right now and then we'll be done. So the integumentary system, is that one you studied in health? Yeah. All right, so it consists of what? What is it? Yeah, you're basically body covering of skin and hair and nails. And that's your integumentary system. It is an important system. It helps protect us from what? Like what's it, something important that our skin protects? Yeah, from pathogens, from illnesses, right? Um, our skin provides a barrier to bacteria and things like that. It also helps to keep our body somewhat waterproof so that um, we don't dehydrate. We have sensors in our skin that can sense temperature and pressure, so they work with our nervous system as well. So it has lots of different functions. Okay. We're going to be talking about these sort of in this order, skeletal, muscular, nervous, endocrine, circulatory, lymphatic, respiratory, digestive, expiratory, reproductive. Actually, we're not going to quite go in that order. But those are the body systems. And remember, we talked about under living things, the organization of living things. We have cells that work together, they form tissues. Tissues work together to form organs. Organs work together to form these organ systems. And all these organ systems working together form a complete living human. And so these systems work together to help to what we call maintain homeostasis. That's an important word to know, homeostasis. We've used that word before. It means to keep things in balance, to keep the proper conditions within the organism. And so these body systems sort of are working together to help make sure that conditions within our body are at the right level to keep us alive. If our body can't maintain homeostasis because something's not working, something's breaking down, then that results in a disease. And as we talk about our body systems, we talk about, okay, here's the system, here's what it does. Here are the organs that allow it to work and how they, how they work together. And then we'll talk about, well, what are some disorders, some diseases, if this body system is not working properly? How can it maybe not function? That's how we'll approach each section. So we'll start today with the skeleton. So our skeletal system, our skeleton, includes our bones. And the purpose of bones are twofold. First of all, they give our body its structure. You know, the only reason I can stand here is because my bones are supporting my body. But also, bones are important for protection. Specific bones in our body protect certain organs from damage. So how many bones are there? I know this is something you had to learn in health. Ethan? 206. 206 bones in an adult body, correct. Now, why do I have to say in an adult body? Yeah? Because there's more in like a baby body because like they have, there's more like loose bones that haven't like Yes. So when I, there's a newborn, the skeleton is really still forming. And there's many places where you have multiple bones that eventually are going to fuse together to form a single bone. But they don't fuse immediately. And so an infant, a baby, has more than 206 bones. And they eventually will fuse together. But a normal adult has 206 bones. Is that when a baby first like, comes out? I don't know if it's so much about the bones more than like the muscles and muscle control that develops over time. Um, 
Yeah, and it takes a while for baby's bones to more fully calcify. A baby and a child's bones are more flexible than an adult bone, not as brittle. So yeah, those things are important. So we talk about the skeletal system. We'll talk about the bones, but also some of the other, what we call connective tissue that helps connect all these things together. So first of all, we have the bone itself. So bone is an important part of the skeletal system, obviously. Bone is living tissue that has blood vessels running through it and nerves running through it. Okay? It's hard, but it's living tissue like any other tissue. It's hard because of the calcium minerals that are put into the bone. And the bones of our skeletal system on the inside have a special material. Do you know what it's called? The material inside of bones? Michael? Yeah, there's something inside of the long bones called bone marrow. And bone marrow has a special purpose because it helps produce something that our body needs. You know what? Yeah, it produces blood cells. So white blood cells and red blood cells are actually produced inside of our bones, in this marrow. Uh, you may have seen it probably if you ever broke open a chicken wing or something and you see some like red stuff inside of the bone, that's marrow. If you ever ate like um, a steak with a bone in it, like a ribeye steak, the center part of that bone um, has like soft stuff in it, you could eat it. It's bone marrow. Uh, it's high in fat. It's um, lot, There's lots of nutrients. Some animals will break open bones to get at the marrow inside because it's a um, good source of nutrition. So connecting these bones together is a type of tough connective tissue called ligaments. Ligaments connect one bone to another bone. Without the ligaments, the skeleton would just fall apart. It's connected by these special tissue called ligaments. Um, I would guess there's probably one ligament you could name. You could definitely give me the three-letter abbreviation for it, many of you. ACL. So have you ever heard of somebody damaging their ACL or tearing their ACL? The ACL, anterior cruciate ligament, is a ligament that's found in a person's knee. There's several ligaments in the knee. And this is a knee joint. And you can see, here's the knee joint, here's the kneecap. These strands of white tissue here, those are the ligaments. There's some on the outside, there's some on the inside. The ACL is a ligament inside of the knee sort of goes diagonal. And what these ligaments do is they help stabilize the knee, okay? So that it doesn't move in the wrong direction, okay? And so when a person is running and cutting, changing direction, they put some pressure on their ACL, okay? Helps stabilize their knee. And sometimes a person has twists their knee in the wrong way, gets hit while their leg is planted, they can actually tear or partially tear that ACL, and it's a pretty significant athletic injury. Um, this year on my soccer, I had two girls, unfortunately, that tore their ACL during the season. And so it's a long recovery. So after tearing an ACL, if you have a full tear, you're out of your sport for that season, certainly. And usually it's about six to nine months of recovery until you can be back playing that sport again takes rehab, they repair it. If you fully tear it, it doesn't heal back together. It's not like breaking a bone where a bone heals. It's basically torn. And they'll take some a strip of muscle or other tissue from somewhere else in your body and they'll put it into your knee to try to like recreate the ACL um, to give your knee the stability. Because without that ACL, you don't have any lateral stability and you can't play your sport. Okay? Um, for those of you that are athletes, especially um, girls, ACL tears are more common in women and girls than they are in boys and men. 
has to do with the anatomy of um, the hips and knees, that they're much more likely to tear an ACL. There are things that you can do as an athlete to reduce the chances of that. Things like working on strengthening of um, their leg muscles, strengthening of core uh, muscles, working on balance, um, so training your body and how to move properly without putting a lot of pressure on your ACL. So that's why you've heard of that because it's a common sports injury. Um, don't, like when you tor tear your ACL, isn't it like, don't you have like the feeling where like, um, you like can't walk on that leg anymore? Don't you have to? Like, um, well, when it first happens, it's painful and you might not be able to put pressure on it. After the swelling goes on and stuff, like normally if a person had a torn ACL, they would be able to walk and could walk straight and so forth. It's the moving and twisting and cutting motions that they wouldn't be able to do. So usually when, after a person tears their ACL, they don't have surgery right away. They give it usually, you know, some time so the swelling can go down. And, um, you know, so, yeah, it's a stabilizing ligament. Yeah, the MCL is a medial cruciate ligament. It's one of these outside ones. It's also commonly strained or sprained, um, but it's not as significant an injury as an ACL. So these, these help stabilize our joints, so they move properly. We have another type of tissue called tendon. This is another connective tissue. Tendon connects bones to muscle. Our muscles are what actually move our bones and they're connected to our bones by these tendons. There's probably one tendon you could name. Your Achilles tendon. Achilles tendon is in your heel. So like if you have low shoes on, just above where your shoe ends and then back of your heel, you may, if you touch that, you may think it's a bone. It's not a bone. It's very tough, hard tissue, but that's not bone. That's your Achilles tendon. It connects your half muscle to this bone at the end of your foot, this heel bone. So when you contract your calf, it pulls on that bone back here and points your toe down. So your calf muscle is connected to your heel by your Achilles tendon. We have another type of tissue. So our, our tendons are what actually pull on the bone and move them. Muscle pulls on tendon, tendon pulls on bone. And then there's another type of tissue called cartilage. Cartilage is found on the ends of our bones, where they meet. And cartilage is a real, a really slippery material. It's a cushioning where our bones meet. Because when our bones meet and are moving near each other and across each other, that would result in a lot of friction, which could damage the bone surface. So they have this slippery stuff around the outside that kind of reduces that friction so they can move more easily. If this cartilage breaks down, it can be painful to move that joint and it can eventually lead to arthritis when that cartilage breaks down. So I know that, yeah, Alex? Well, to prevent arthritis, like for example, um, I um, tore my meniscus. So my menis your meniscus is some cartilage in your knee, shaped like a half moon. So every time you step or walk or run, when you put weight on it, the cartilage there, your meniscus helps cushion it. I tore mine playing soccer, my meniscus. So the doctor had to go and do surgery and basically cut out the tear because it was painful, it limited my mobility. But now there's less cushioning in my knee. And so every time I go running or play soccer or do something athletic, there's less cushioning, so there's more damage to it. And over time, if you lose that cartilage, it wears away, that can lead to arthritis. And that's what the doctor said. That you may be at an increased risk of getting arthritis as you get older because that cartilage is gone in your knee or meniscus, so it's doing more damage. So um, trying not to damage those, that cartilage is the best thing probably. 
So you guys had to memorize the bones probably and help, right? Yeah. You also have to know that for your quiz in science as well. I think these are relatively easy. Um, let's just go through this list a little bit. Who could name, raise your hand please. Ava. What, yeah, this is the cranium. You know, you might call it your skull. We're gonna use the technical names. Okay, that's the cranium. What's the purpose of the cranium? What's its function? Brandon? It's like protect the brain. Yeah, it's a protective one. It protects your brain. Obviously, your brain is extremely important. It's keeping you alive. Your cranium protects your brain. The brain is inside this thick bone. So if you fall and hit your head, you're not going to damage your brain. It can be protected somewhat. All right. Your clavicle. Clavicle is what we would might call your collarbone. So your clavicle is here, it's part of your sort of upper torso, your shoulder. Um, and clavicle works with to establish your shoulder joint and so forth. This is another common fracture. Anybody in here broken their collarbone before? Yeah, so sometimes when people fall, they might fall on it. If you're, um, get pushed down, if you're snowboarding something, sometimes you fall, if you like catch yourself with your hands, the force can actually break your collarbone. It's not a thick bone. Um, and if you fracture your collarbone, you probably have to wear a sling for a while until it heals. My daughter broke her collarbone. Jordan? Isn't it, what is that? Isn't it a collarbone when if you break it a certain amount of times, it can't re heal? It can't like re heal the way? It's I'm not sure. I mean, it has to be stabilized. I'm not sure about that. I think it can re heal. What's that one bone like? I'm not sure. Um, the sternum is this, is, you might call it your breast bone, your chest bone, right in the middle of your chest, very thick, very hard bone, where your ribs meet at the center of your chest. What's the function of your sternum? Vienna? To keep your ribs in place? Um, yeah, sort of, and with your ribs, it, it's doing something else as well. Jenna? Protect your heart yeah, and lungs. Yeah, it's protecting some really important organs, your heart and lungs are protected by your sternum and your ribcage together. They protect those important organs. You have 24 ribs that form your ribcage. They connect at the sternum, the top of your chest. Our arms are set up in that there's our upper arm has one large bone right here. This is called the humerus. Okay. And that's your upper arm bone, sorry, your bicep area. Your vertebrae are these bones that make up, what would we call this? Spine. Your spine. Your spine has this sort of S-shaped curve, and it's made of a whole series of bones stacked one on top of each other. Okay. There's 33 vertebrae that make up your spine. They're stacked on top of each other. Each one has a little disc of cartilage between it to cushion it so they can move. So as you walk, the impact doesn't hit bone on bone. The cartilage separates them. Sometimes people damage this cartilage. You might have like a herniated disc or a bulging disc in your back if you've ever heard of that. That's caused by damage to this cartilage. In your forearm, we have actually two bones in here. They're called the ulna and the radius. You can see them here. The skeleton. There's two separate bones in your forearm. In fact, if you grab onto like your mid forearm and twist your wrist, your hand, you could feel them moving. So the radius and ulna, as you twist your wrist, they rotate one over the other, and you could feel that those bones in there kind of rotating. Um, and so the radius is the one that's on your thumb side. That's the radius. The one on your pinky side is called the ulna. And to help you remember, this is what I say, like your thumb is the finger that can move like in a complete circle. And a circle has a radius. So the thumb side is called the radius. The pinky side is called the ulna.
Continuing down the pelvis, pelvis is large bone that forms your hip joints. Okay, that's the pelvis. And, oh, up here, too, it mentions the scapula. So your scapula, what, what might you call it? What's, like, the common name for these bones? Shoulder blades. Shoulder blades. Like, if you reach behind your back and, like, try to scratch your back, you feel that bone that kind of sticks out. That's your, that's your scapula. Got one on each side. And those are your shoulder blades. On our legs, we have, our, our legs are set up like our, like our arms. Again, the upper part of your leg, your thigh, you have one bone, the femur, the largest bone in the body. Very thick, very strong. And then in your lower leg, you have two bones again. Okay. So femur's on top. Below it, you have a bone called the tibia. That's the thicker one. Your shin bone, the one you feel right at the front of your lower leg. And then sort of next to it, sort of behind it, is a bone called the fibula. That's the thinner one. Now, they don't rhyme. People always want to like call it fibia and tibia. Okay? It's tibia and fibula. So sometimes people say it incorrectly. Yeah? And then what's between these two bones? Joint. It's, a, it's your knee joint. Covering it is the kneecap, called the patella. Okay, and those are the bones that you're gonna have to know. Now, I wanna talk lastly about the joints of the body. So joints are where two bones meet. And there's a few different types of joints that we're gonna talk about. So there's four types of movable joints where the bones that, are, that meet are going to move in some way. First one's called a hinge joint. What is a hinge? Where would I find a hinge? On a door. On a door. This door has three hinges on it, pieces of metal that connect it, and they allow this door to swing open. But they only allow it to move in one direction, like this, back and forth. I can't lift up here. I can't rotate it forward. This hinge just allows the door to swing in one plane of motion. That's true in our body as well. Our elbow, for example, our knee, your elbow only moves in this single direction, up and down this way. You can't move from your elbow, you can't move your hand left and right, okay? You can only bend it up and down. Same thing for your knee. Your knee only bends in one direction. Okay? Can't move your foot like this at your knee. Unless, unless you have some serious injury. Okay? So those are hinge joints. And they work like that because of the shape of the joint. The shape of the joint, there's a little groove that allows the bones only to go this certain way. <clears throat> to get a more range of motion, we have another type of joint called the ball and socket joint. Examples of this are where? Thumb. Thumb, your hip and your leg, and your shoulder. So your shoulder, you could move your arm at your shoulder joint up and down, okay, left and right. You can rotate it through this very wide range of motion. Same thing with your hip joint. You can move in multiple directions. And it should make sense why you can do that. So a ball and socket joint, at the top of your femur, you have this ball, this round area. It fits in here, a little cup shape, okay? A socket where it fits in, and that allows the ball to move around inside that, giving a very um, diverse range of motion. Jordan? We also have gliding joints, like your vertebrae, where one bone sits on top of, each of another, and they kind of slide on top of each other. They can sort of one twist, and then the other, and so that's why we can kind of 
twist our torso, because each of those bones moves a little bit, allowing us to twist. Jordan? Um, you know, when you like, crack your bones and stuff, like, what does that like, do? Sometimes you get air trapped in a joint, and cracking in something like your knuckles releases that air. That popping is that air being released. It's not really going to cause arthritis either. You know your parents talk about that. Your pi a pivot joint allows for rotation. Like in your head, a pivot joint in your neck allows you to move your head sort of left and right like that. Wait, so is that a bad thing? No. All right. Um, the last type of joint is what's called an immovable joint, a fixed joint where the bones actually are not going to move, where you have two bones that are fused together, and so they don't move. An example of this is in your cranium. Your cranium is actually made of several bones, and when you're born, those bones are all separate from each other. But eventually they fuse together to form a fixed joint. And you could see them in a cranium. That I, I, when I was away um, over break, I was in Paris visiting my daughter who was studying there. We went in the Paris catacombs, I'll show you a picture in a minute, where they have the bones of six million people have been relocated into the Paris catacombs. And you can see lots of them. And in the skulls and the cranium, in the you could see the, the fixed joints it looks like a zigzag line at the top of the cranium where those bones fuse together. Now, when a baby's born, they're not fused together. There's a gap there. Do you know what they call it? Soft, soft spot. Yeah, a soft spot, a fontanelles it's called. And sometimes you can see in a baby, if they don't have any hair, you could see as their pulse and their heart beats, you could see this little soft spot go up and down as their heart beats kind of here. Eventually, if they do fuse together, um, Sometimes when a baby is being born, as they get squeezed through the birth canal, through the pelvis, those plates get sort of misshapen a little bit. They can have like a cone head. <laughs> but usually within a day or two, they sort of go back. And now it's important that those, those joints don't fuse too early, because if they do, there's not enough room for the brain to expand as it grows, and that's a problem. Here are some pictures I took in the catacombs last week. Oh so basically in the catacombs, they have taken, so in Paris, they had to relocate the bones from all these different grave, graveyards. And they put them all in one location. And what they did is they built, they put them in these tunnels underground, and they built walls out of the bones. So as you're walking through the catacombs, the walls on each side of you are made of bones. Like these are all femurs, and then they put skulls. They do them sometimes in these decorative patterns. Here, they form a heart of skulls in the wall, and all these are the femur bones sort of stacked facing outward. And they did that for fun? They did it, um, I don't, they, they did it because conditions in the cemeteries in the various places in Paris are sort of unsanitary during the plague and things and they needed to do something with them, so they brought them all to this one area where they could put them together. Yeah, they built walls. This is around, there's a pillar in here, but all around the outside, it's all covered in bones. It's kind of strange to walk through here. It's underground, it's really dark. Um, they have some information about this. Is, yeah. is that why when they, they say, like, rub your baby's head, is that why it's going back to shape? No, I don't know, maybe, I'm not sure. I don't think you have to actually put it in here. 